Well, good evening and thank you for your patience. I apologize for the uh, delay. We had a little difficulty. It's been a while since I've done this live stream and uh, obviously we wasn't hit, hitting quite the right buttons, but um, we're glad you're here. Uh, welcome to Copernicus Observatory. For, uh, for any of you who might be uh, here for the first time, um, Copernicus is located in Vestal, New York, uh, upstate New York. We are a public observatory and a STEM education center. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we are not in a position to actually have people uh, on, you know, come up actually here, you know, to Copernic uh, for any uh, any of our programs or uh, observing. So we are doing what we can uh, virtually through our through our live stream capabilities. And uh, uh, so uh, tonight's, I just want to let you know that we've got uh, a number of uh, live streams scheduled uh, coming up. Tonight is obviously uh, Fall Skies, which we'll get to here in a few moments. The um, uh, uh, next week, next Friday, is actually a, um, a program that we've had scheduled for the better part of nine months. Uh, it's called uh, Exposure, and it's actually it's, uh, it's called the Fifth Exposure. Uh, there is a uh, Binghamton University uh, professor in the in the uh, film department, uh, Tomon uh, uh, Tomon. Uh, no, but I'm blocking his name right now. So sorry, this this uh, technical. Technical problem had me a little flustered, so I apologize. Anyway, um, uh, Tomo Nishikawa is a professor in the uh, film department at uh, Binghamton University, and uh, this will actually be the fifth time that he's put together, curated a series of short films with sort of astronomical uh, themes, or, or, or specifically focusing on the moon and light, and uh, sort of looking looking at that through sort of an artistic vision. And uh, so he's actually, I believe, has six short films. Uh, the, the program will last about an hour. And then there will be a Q&A session afterwards. And uh, right now it looks like we have three of the filmmakers that will actually be available, uh, that will be uh, sort of zoomed in, if you will. And you'll be able to actually ask questions of those filmmakers through uh, the chat window. So if you've got any uh, uh, questions um, uh, that you'd like to ask the filmmakers, you can actually do that through the chat through the chat session. That'll be next Friday. Then uh, the next day we'll pick it right back up again. Is uh, next Saturday, uh, September twenty sixth, is International Observe the Moon Night, and we will have a combination of, uh, of, of a sort of a lunar program, if you will, uh, put on by the Gemini uh, Astronomy Club, which is actually a uh, astronomy club hosted here at Copernic that is. Uh, uh, specifically for the Girl Scouts, and uh, they'll be putting together a great uh, uh, program uh, about the moon and International Observe the Moon Night. And then, again, assuming that the uh, we, we've got clear skies, uh, Jeremy Cardi, our resident uh, live streamer and uh, uh, and live stream observer, will uh, do a, a tour of the moon and some other uh, uh, deep sky objects um, uh, through our telescopes. So that's another one not to be missed. Then uh, in a few weeks after that, we'll have uh, David Woods, uh, who is a retired aerospace engineer from uh, IBM and Lockheed Martin, talk about the uh, engineering behind the Discovery Abort system. The, 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 the Space Shuttle Discovery actually had uh, an abort that they had to deal with, and uh, David will talk about the engineering behind that. Uh, then toward the end of uh, toward the end of. Uh, of October, we're going to be doing our Astrofest, our, our, our winter, star, our, our, our annual star party. But that also will be virtual, and we're lining up speakers for that. And we're doing uh, looking, um, finishing the, the final details on some additional speakers in November. So uh, this will be a, a great opportunity to uh, um, continue your, uh, you know, lifelong learning, uh, albeit at home. And uh, um, but anyway, we're going to turn this over now to. Uh, uh, Robert Burns. Uh, Robert is a member of the Copernic Astronomic Society, the uh, uh, astronomy club that that, uh, that resides here at, uh, at Copernic. I'll let him introduce himself and then we'll just jump right into the program. So Robert, it's up to you. I'm going to put my mask on. He's going to take his off. So let's, uh, let's, let's do this right. Let's, let's follow the science, stay safe, stay healthy. All right. Here you go, Robert. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for joining us here at Copernic Digitally. Uh, this is my first digital presentation, so hopefully it doesn't go too awful bad. But uh, thank you so much for being here uh, with us. 
and we can get started into the slideshow. There we go. Fall skies or autumn skies. As the weather gets colder, the nights get a little bit longer. Fall and through the winter is a great night for viewing. Uh, in particular right now with the, I'm sorry, I'm being told to speak up, so I'm gonna try to speak up and be a little bit louder here. Um, I'm gonna go right into this. Mm -hmm. There, so um, over the course of the summer, there was a comet that visited our skies at the north. If any of you got to see it, this is maybe what the view you had. Uh, from a simple cell phone picture at the beginning left-hand side to through uh, DS DSLR cameras on the far right. Uh, it was a spectacular comet that was just identified in our neighborhood back in March and it passed by brilliantly in July. Uh, you never know how these new things are gonna be coming up and we, there's always new things to discover in space and it's a wonderful thing. Uh, these three images were taken by members here at Copernic. Like I said, the first one on the, on the far left here is a simple cell phone picture. Uh, astronomy does not need to be uh, a huge investment. It can be just your eyes looking up or binoculars to a cell phone to very expensive cameras. Uh, these two pictures here were taken with more of a, a true uh, DSLR. Uh, I think they're spectacular and even NASA with the Parker Space Probe had this image. A lot more background, a lot more uh, of that ion uh, field on the left side of the comet, but pretty similar pictures in, in actuality. Uh, it's amazing stuff though. I'm happy to see uh, how versatile astronomy can be from the simplest to the most technical. All right. Uh, so Drew did talk about, I'm a member of the Copernic Astronomical Society. If you would like more information about joining that club, uh, there is a uh, email address here at the bottom of the screen. We do have our own website. It can be reached through Copernic's own website. Uh, but for specifically looking to join the club, you can email the email on the screen, please. The uh, membership at copernicastro.org. During the presentation, we're going to be using uh, open source material. These are the websites that are commonly used to put together these presentations that I've been able to give uh, about four times a year, and I'm really happy to be able to do that. Uh, the last slide of my presentation is also going to be these links, so you don't need to worry about writing them down right now. I'll put them in the chat. Okay, and they're going to be added to the chat, so that's cool. Um, Facebook being a thing is always trying to shout from the rooftop the newest bits of space news. And if you haven't seen it, uh, I think everyone has the possibility of life on Venus. Uh, the paper that was published didn't actually specify that they know there's life there. It is saying that there is a gas in the atmosphere that they can't explain in any other way. Uh, I've read a couple of the different um, reviews of this paper and you know, people are scratching their head. Where is this gas being produced? How is it there? Um, it is interesting. Venus, uh, for those that don't know, is one of the hardest uh, uh, environments for our technology to exist in. Russians have had uh, successful missions that landed on the surface, but they only last a few hours under the pressure and heat of Venus. It's one of the hottest places in our solar system to, to be, and it's a, in a a very hostile environment. But with this new finding, hopefully NASA and others will be sending more probes to Venus. Um, I forgot to mention, and, and I think uh, Drew and I both uh, want everyone to know, at 8.12 tonight, we're gonna be taking a pause and we're gonna be going outside. And I would like you to go outside as well and see if we can see the International Space Station pass overhead. Although actually, there's only, there's, there's one person here from, watching from Italy, so he's not gonna oh. see it. <laughs> well, thank you for joining here, us from Italy. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but we're going, part of the demonstration, part of the presentation here tonight is going to be talking about how to know when the International, International Space Station is passing over, or if you do identify a satellite passing over, how to figure out which satellite it might have been through the website Heavens Above. We'll get to that very soon. Um, but specifically, back to Venus. If you'd like to see Venus because it's in the news, it is visible in our morning skies. Push the button three times, there we go. Um, it is going to be for those that are up early in the morning though, so like we're talking 5.30 in the morning. Uh, it is probably going to be the brightest object in your sky, unless the moon is out. Uh, it is going to be right above the eastern horizon. This is a screen capture from our program, not ours, I'm sorry, a program called uh, Stellarium. It is going to be low in the horizon, but right on that cardinal bearing of due east, about where you're going to see the sun rise in a couple, uh, about 30 minutes from then. So you would like to have a nice, clear, flat view of the horizon to the east, 5 o'clock in the morning through 5.30, uh, you will see Venus. Now, one of the constellations that will be very easy to see that sits a little bit below Venus is Leo the Lion. Uh, but you'll see this hook shape or backwards question mark. It's called the sickle and it's the head or the mane of the lion as it comes up over the ground here and it starts to, to look up over the horizon. And right in front of that sickle will be a very bright object and that will be Venus. Do, do, do. Okay, moving forward. Some other events that are going to be coming over the course of the fall here. Uh, the 22nd is going to be the physical change between summer and winter when the sun is over the equator and we have an equal length of day and night. Uh, that is our um, autumn equinox. As Drew mentioned, the International Observer, uh, Observe the Moon Night is going to be the 26th. The image that I have on the screen of the moon is a good representation of what the moon might look like that night. Uh, many people think that looking at the full moon might be the best and most brilliant, but it can be overpowering. It can be so bright in even a pair of binoculars that it can hurt your eyes. When the moon is shaded at all, and like this, it's about halfway shaded, that edge where the light and darkness meet can produce some extremely brilliant views of those craters and mountains that are on the moon. And you can just be amazed and walk up and down that little, that line of where light and darkness meet. It's a, it's a beautiful thing to see. Um, so if you'd like to see it, that will be on the 26th. Uh, hopefully we'll have clear skies and Jeremy will be able to use our telescopes to live stream that view to you. Uh, in the month of October, there are actually two full moons both on the 1st and the 31st. Uh, so the 31st moon would be technically a, what they call the blue moon, a second full moon of the year, or of the month, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> on the 13th of October, Mars is at opposition, which means it is as close to the Earth as it's going to be during this year. It does appear a bit brighter. Uh, it does steadily increase and then fade over the course of the weeks before and after. So don't expect on the 13th to be shocked that it's completely different than it was on the 12th. It doesn't really work that way, but again, uh, a lot of your social media sites would, would make you think that. Uh, during this time, through October and a little bit afterwards, if you do have a pair of binoculars or a, uh, even a small telescope, surface detail on Mars would be most detectable during this time. When we are the closest to it, it's getting a full nice um, uh, full surface lit of the sun and it can be quite spectacular to see. Last year, if you remember if, uh, your normal, uh, an active uh, stargazer, uh, Mars had a um, global sandstone, sandstorm for lack of a better word. The detail that we were accustomed to see 
was more or less wiped clean. It was like an Etch-a-Sketch that had been shooken by a <laughs> giant, and all the discernible features were gone. Uh, those are returning, and there are marks that you might be able to see. During this opposition is the best chance that you'll have to see those. Um, moving down on my calendar to the 22nd through the 20, I'm sorry, the evening of the 21st into the morning of the 22nd is the Orion uh, meteorite shower, the Orionids. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, meteorite showers of the year, not because of its, uh, it's, uh, it's overly spectacular with a numerous um, uh, number of meteorites, but knowing that that is the leftovers of Halley's Comet. So for those that don't know, uh, as we pass through space in our solar system, as we're uh, being whipped around the sun, we pass through these uh, old comets um, trails, uh, for lack of a better word, and those dust particles that were left as it blazes towards the sun, we pass through, and then when they hit our atmosphere, they fall as meteorites. Uh, so the yearly meteorite showers that we have throughout the year that you, know, you can set a calendar to, that's what they are from, different comets. And this one here happens to be from Halley's Comet. Um, it is pretty much the entire month of October that you might see an uptake in meteorite activity. Uh, and it is on the evening of the 21st that it is, we are in, in the heaviest debris field, if you will. The, the largest amount of material that will pass through is during that time. So that's when meteorite, the meteorite shower will meet its peak. All right. We're going to keep moving a little bit quick because we want to see uh, the International Space Station. Uh, in your um, comments below, there should be a link for you to download your very own evening sky map. For those of you that do come to Copernic, this is one of the things that you grab right at the register. Uh, it is not produced by us, but we are, operate under the um, copyright of the company that we can distribute these. Excuse me. These are a very good monthly produced map full of information. The left hand side of the, of the page itself has a pretty much nightly um, event list that you might be able to look for, excuse me again, and then a very clear, simple to use representation of the night sky here. Uh, for those that are unfamiliar with using any type of paper sky maps, when you first look at them, the, you might notice one peculiar item. North and south are where you think they should be, but east and west have been reversed. And that is simply because these are usually drawn so that a person holds them while they face south. So if you were to imagine yourself facing south, the word south is at the bottom of the page, then indeed your east and west would be then properly labeled on that piece of paper. Um, as you would turn, and face the east, you would just simply rotate that paper 90 degrees counterclockwise, and then the representation of the constellations would reflect what you might be able to see in the sky. Obviously, this does not take into account to what your horizon may look like. Uh, your horizon could be blocked by a hill, by a building, or whatever. Uh, so if there is something in the sky, if it's close to that edge of that circle, you definitely want to move to a place where you can have a good, clear view of that horizon. One of the uh, terms that we'll see on the map later on in the presentation is the word zenith. The zenith, and you, I will show you a, a, a zoomed in picture here, is just simply represented by a small X on this map. Your zenith is where you see the night sky directly above your head. And the horizon is obviously where the ground meets the sky. If you were able to pass a line between north and south through the zenith, that is your meridian. That is your halfway point. These simple terms end up being very useful when you are trying to talk to somebody or point something out or use a reference chart like this. Uh, it may talk about finding your zenith and moving here uh, that's why, uh, you know, it's such a common term for us, but it could be a, a foreign one and I wanted you to be aware of it. Uh, this 
map is is wonderful. We really enjoy using it, but it's not the only one out there. The Astronomical Society produces one as well. It is the one here on the left. This is a much uh, sim more simplified sky map, and it is much more of a, a trip outside and to perform a, a process that we call star hopping. It's going to help you to identify simple to see objects and then move along a path to find the next object it wants to talk about. Um, it is a little bit more cartoonish. I find that my boys that are younger really kind of can follow along with this one much better than uh, the other, but it, you know, it is what you want to make of it. You know, it's, it's how you, you know, look for them, see them, and see which one you like better. The one on the right-hand side of the screen is one produced by the program I had mentioned earlier called um, Heavens Above. This is a little bit plain, but the benefit this has is that you can make it for the sky at your house tonight, or your house, or your cabin, maybe your cottage, someplace else, and it could be it could be tailor made for you when you intend to go viewing, and you can just print that one off for that event. And I have found it much more uh, easy to explain to multiple people having what the sky looks like tonight. If I were to go back a couple slides and show you the one I love to use here, the evening sky map, if we are at past midnight. We are no longer holding it simply with south facing south. You have to start turning it like a clock to start to make things match. Um, and I'm sure many of you have seen those sky maps that have a wheel that you can turn and you can set them for each hour. Uh, they're a brilliant tool, very simple to use. Um, and that is more like the sky maps that you can make from heavens above. Uh, I do not get into um, apps in my presentation here too much. There are many apps that you can use to track the night sky, and they too are very useful. Uh, one thing I would caution about any of the apps is to make sure that you have turned down the dimness of your phone. Uh, that cell phone, especially the blue light from that phone, will really affect your eyesight. And if you are looking for faint, dim objects, a couple seconds of looking at that screen can really kind of knock out your low light vision. Um, you know, we talk about having red lights here. There are many people that, like anything else, you know, you talk about people fishing maybe, and then you talk about people that are deep sea fishermen, you know, their, their tackle is so much different than if you're a fly fisherman, correct? Um, the red lights that are used at some of these astronomy clubs are so dimly red that you can barely see anything from them. But you know, the, the more you want to protect your night vision, the dimmer the object you want to see, the more that does need to be protected. Uh, and that gets into a whole conversation too about uh, getting out away from the town lights, uh, get into a nice dark spot to see the night sky. We are 12 minutes away or so, 13 minutes away from the ISS coming up over the horizon, so I'm going to press on and talk about finding the ISS. The International Space Station, uh, the website Heavens Above, I put it, in the chat. it is in the chat, has a great um, way of viewing this. It's probably like the third or fourth um, pick down from the top after you arrive on the website. And when you click on it, the first thing it will go to is a screen that looks like this here on our left. It will predict when the next visible passes for the ISS will be uh, viewable from your location, provided that you have correctly um, inputted your, your location on the website. Usually when you arrive for the first time, it would simply ask to use the device's location and as long as your GPS is turned on, if it's a phone or um, your IP um, address is not blocking your signal, it will 
auto populate that location. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Obviously, the ISS is passing overhead whether or not you can see it or not all day long. Uh, when we can see it, it is not because of light being uh, sent by any you know, lights on board, but a reflection of the sunlight uh, that glints off the side of the spacecraft. And when, because of its elevation, it could be still in the sunshine as it passes over us when we are at night. And it could be pretty amazing when you can find one of these passes where it actually disappears mid-sky, especially if you have kids with you and it just blinks out and it's gone. They love to, I love to watch my, the face of my kids when that happens, but okay. We are going to be going outside to see a pass. I do not have a printed view of what that would look like, but I did print off a couple of what it might look like in the next couple nights. So if you see here on the chart, there are two passes that occur tomorrow night. One at 1927, which is 727, and another at 2104, which is 904. So if I were to click, if I was online, on this 19th, it would give me this chart and this map. This map you can orientate it to the night sky exactly the same way. South is on the bottom, north, west, east. And it has these arrows. Let me see, I'm, my mouse is at the wrong spot. It has arrows listing the direction of travel of the ISS. And it actually has the time increments of where it will be as it passes through the night sky. This is the pass at 7.30. If we move forward on the slides, this is the path at nine o'clock. Notice the perceived location is so different than it was before. You know, the earth has moved, <laughs> the stars look to be in different locations, and this satellite is passing over our heads. This evening, it's going to appear out of our western sky near the constellation of Sagittarius. Constellations have been labeled and described for thousands of years. Today we recognize 88 different constellations. I do not know the exact number of asterisms that there are, but an asterism is not a recognized constellation, but a grouping of stars that make a a familiar pattern. If you were to look on the sky chart map, the evening sky map, this label here, the teapot, is the asterism, the teapot. It is part of the constellation Sagittarius. It is a very recognizable shape in the night sky. It is those stars that make up the teapot are very nice and bright and we are going to move one slide forward. Here is the teapot. If you can imagine, this is where the tea would come from. This is the handle, this is the top, okay? And to its left are the planets, Jupiter and Saturn. I'm sure um, many of us have seen these two bright objects passing through the night sky. From my house here in Bingham, I can't see any stars out my window, but I can see these two planets, and uh, it, they are very bright and very distinctive in the night sky. So I'm going to turn on the lines that are drawn in, and here is uh, the teapot, which is part of the constellation Sagittarius, as we've said, and it is directly due south here this evening. So that is our meridian, all right? Um, I have, we have five minutes, Drew? Oh, five minutes. Uh, yeah, well, about seven minutes? Seven minutes. Um, so I'll show you one more thing here. So looking at Jupiter, Jupiter and Saturn following each other through the night sky uh, is one of the best times to be here at Copernic, and I wish you could be here with us. 
viewing Jupiter and Saturn with our scopes and seeing them for yourself is an amazing thing. Uh, even with small telescopes, you can see the rings of Saturn and the four of the jovial moons of Jupiter. And using this program, Stellarium, you can zoom in to what these things might look like. Here is a pretty good representation of, on a perfect night, what Jupiter may look like. We describe it sometimes as a white screw with a uh, slot in the middle of it when we're talking to the, you know, especially like a younger person. And to its left and right would be four moons. These moons are the jovial moons that were first seen by Galileo. And over the course of even a few hours, uh, overnight, they change their positions and they uh, follow a predicted path and you can download that and figure out which of they are. But uh, when you are in uh, Stellarium, they are represented by their true position. So if you, you were using uh, Stellarium with an app outside, you could identify which of those four jovial moons you're looking at. Sometimes you don't see all four because they could be uh, more or less hidden in, by view because they are passing behind Jupiter. Here's Jupiter through Hubble. I wish that was our view from our telescopes here, but uh, maybe a, a few billion dollars more we could we could get an image like that. But until then, we're I'm happy with what we do have. Back to Saturn. Uh, Saturn, too, you can not only see its rings, but we can see several of its, um, uh, of its moons, and they do appear to be a, like a diamond chip sometimes. That's how I've described them when I've tried to talk to people. Like, the stars in the background will be nice in, like, pinpoints, but the moons themselves that are close to Saturn end up being very bright white and, and noticeable. These two can, uh, or these two do rotate around Saturn, obviously, and uh, throughout a course of the evening, they can migrate and disappear. The One of the enjoyable things about watching Saturn, I have found, uh, is how the rings tip and wobble. They will change position over the course of uh, months to years, and, you know, from one season to the next, you might have a different presentation of the rings of Saturn. Uh, and for fun, here is the uh, NASA picture of Saturn that was released here, uh, well, a year ago by NASA. Um, eight minutes out. Let's see. And uh, we probably have about uh, 12 minutes, uh, four, four minutes before it rises above yeah. the horizon. So maybe. So, you know, I'm going to jump out of my um, presentation real quick and go into Stellarium. Because I want to, I want you to see what this might look like. Drew, is that going to be on my screen? Okay, yep. or do I need to move it any different? No, nope, that's good. Okay. Just do what you want to do. Then. In a few moments, if we go outside together and you look south, I hope you see Jupiter and Saturn right straight south. And he, yes, are you tracking my mouse? Okay. Uh, yep. You see it. Here is the constellation of. Uh, well, this is the astrum of the teapot. I'm going to turn on my the lines. Here is the constellation Sagittarius, okay? I'm going to turn that back off so we don't get distracted by those, but I'm going to speed up our time here a little bit. Actually, you need to go back because it's... Uh, oh, did it? It's, uh, yes, go, it go did. To, go to, yep. No, actually, you're already past 9 o'clock, so go, go to now, to the right, to the right of the... Uh, I'm sorry, Drew. Yeah, if you go to the... Uh, right here? Right there, yep. Yep. Okay. Now. Yep. So we go here now, and then I'm just going to speed up our time just a little bit. We can see there it goes. And that's really moving fast. <laughs> I'm going to bring it back a little bit. So from the southwest sky, a very bright object will come up and start passing over the top of our teapot, pass over the top of Jupiter and Saturn. This is the International Space Station. 
And if you can see that, you are seeing these uh, astronauts as they fly past us. If you drag it down, you can take this one off the screen. Yep. Yeah. I, uh, I'm going to back it up. There we go. Stellarium is a free planetary software. If you have not downloaded, you may, and it's free. It works on any platform. It is an amazing tool. There are so many times that you will see a social media post about um, an object, and you can plug in the time and date, and you can see whether or not you will be able to see it or you know, at your location. We'll talk about that a little bit more soon. Let's uh, get outside, Drew. I think it's 8.11. I'm going to let Stellarium just run. Actually, yeah, so let's, let's put it to now. OK. All right, so uh, we're gonna, <laughs> Robert and I are going to go outside, and um, we're going to uh, take a look at it. But uh, just a little bit of background. Again, it's going to come out of the southwest uh, and go almost directly above us. It's, it's actually going to go right through the middle of the summer triangle with Vega, Altair, and then Deneb. That's part of the uh, constellation Cygnus the Swan. And it's going going right through the uh, uh, the Milky Way, so if you have a relatively dark sky, you may be able to see uh, the Milky Way uh, this evening at the same time. Uh, again, it's traveling at seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour, and um, uh, so Robert and I are going to go. Actually, we'll, we're going to show you where we're going to go. Actually, I'll uh, actually I won't because I don't have the webcam turned on. <laughs> so uh, we're going to head out, and um, we'll pop back in. Uh, from time to time, just to keep keep you updated, but uh, hopefully uh, you get a chance to see it. If you haven't, if this is your first time, it'll be quite exciting. So we're gonna actually head right out that door right, right there. in here just making sure that uh, it's doing its thing so technically it's just now coming above the horizon we can actually sort of turn off the uh and there it, there it is right there so turn back on the so you can see it's just above the horizon right now. It's not even uh, 10 degrees above. You can actually sort of zoom in on it. And you'll see that it's barely six degrees above the horizon. I'm going to pop back out and uh, see if we can uh, locate it. The, the challenge here is that we're in a lit room, then walking outside, you almost see nothing. It takes a couple of, you know, at least a minute for your eyes to begin to uh, uh, acclimate to being outside again. So uh, uh, give your, if you're outside with your phone uh, watching this, uh, just give yourself uh, a little time for your eyes to adjust.
All right, well, Robert and I have, uh, <laughs> have seen it. It's, uh, for some reason, Stellarium is not keeping up, and I don't know why. Because it should, it was up around 10 degrees or so. Um, yeah, there it is. For some reason, the Stellarium is not uh, not keeping up and moving, and I'm sure. Maybe uh, because we're streaming too. Yeah. How many miles above us is that? So it's traveling at. Uh, and it's about 250 to 270 miles uh, above us. Again, traveling at uh, 17,500 miles an hour, and uh, makes 16 orbits of the uh, of the Earth every day. And uh, so it spends about 45 minutes in light and 45 minutes in darkness. Uh, the um, okay, we should. Um, uh, no. So I think it's passed through the uh, Summer Triangle already. Any comments in the chat? No, it's... We were up around 15, 16 earlier. And hopefully you also got a chance to see uh, Saturn and Jupiter as it uh, 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 flew, you know, a fair amount above it. But it was uh, you could see them there. They're those two really bright uh, objects uh, in the south. Uh, you Dom can, you know, dominating the night. So. Right. Yeah. You can't call them stars because they're not stars. <laughs> There are currently uh, three astronauts on uh, three three people on board, two cosmonauts and a uh, and an astronaut. The American astronaut is Chris Cassidy. He uh, I think launched in March, and he's due to come back. Uh, in less than a month, I guess middle of, middle of uh, of October, he's looking forward to that. Uh, earlier uh, this summer, uh, the SpaceX uh, uh, launched a uh, a new first. A, a new, it, its first uh, crew cabin called the uh, Sp uh, Crew Dragon, and um, a local astronaut, Doug Hurley, uh, who hails from uh, from Appalachian. Was uh, the commander of the uh, of that Crew Dragon, and they spent uh, three months. Uh, they they launched in uh, end of May, and came back um, uh, early early August, and successfully had a great uh, a great mission. And uh, so for a time they had uh, five astronauts on board. Now uh, now they're back down to three, and I believe um, soon uh, in an, another couple of weeks I believe. Uh, the SpaceX will be sending up uh, four astronauts, and one of them mm -hmm. may actually be. Um, um, I take that back. It's not. Um, <laughs> there's an astronaut, uh, Jeanette Epps, who grew up in uh, Syracuse, and I believe she's actually going to be on the Boeing uh, or, um, or you know Orion um, uh, mission uh, that'll be early next year. So, uh, a lot of lo good local connections here to. Uh, 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 to the space program. So, 
Uh, let's see, we are probably pretty close to being out of sight, yeah. out, of sight out of mind, and uh, let's see here. If it's, uh, what time is it now? 21.43, and let's, yeah. so I'd say we're, I'd say we're good, and we'll, uh, we'll get back to uh, a regularly scheduled program. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I really hope people did get outside and see that. For me, it was really interesting to uh, walk out, as Drew had said, from our brightly uh, lit meeting room here into the night sky. The only two things I could see right away were Jupiter and Saturn. And one by one, the stars kind of started to blink in. And uh, sure enough, the first constellation and or group of stars, rather, I could see was that teapot. Uh, and it, like, turned on as if uh, it was a light switch. It was kind of neat as my eyes were adjusting. Um, we are going to talk for a few more minutes about uh, some constellations now, some deeper space objects. It is, uh, and towards the end, we'll talk about uh, seeing a whole different uh, solar system. And that is a very dim object, and you will want to have uh, your eyes properly adjusted for that if you get a chance to see this. Uh, and it's a very easy thing to see. It's the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, so we're back in our presentation here, and we're going to leave the, uh, our solar system, leave our little uh, fragile Earth, those guys floating around us, and move out into the great skies. Come on. There we go. All right. Again, this is using the uh, Stellarium software. We are looking due south. This is a little bit of an exaggeration. You have to have some pretty dark skies to be able to see the Milky Way this way. Uh, but as close as uh, Cherry Springs in Pennsylvania, they have uh, some sky uh, star parties and you can see these types of views. Uh, using a simple camera capturing um, uh, an image for maybe like 10, 30 seconds, your camera would be able to see the Milky Way in this uh, much detail. Um, and if you were to look here at the teapot again, uh, this time of year, now that Sagittarius has tipped almost up, almost 90 degrees, uh, it looks like the Milky Way is steam rushing out of the teapot as it's being poured. Uh, you might hear that in some of the different conversations. Anyway, um, Drew did mention the Summer Triangle. This is one of our other easy to see um, asterisms, and it is at that zenith that is labeled on the maps. Your zenith is directly above your head. Here you have uh, Vega, uh, Deneb, and Altair. Altair. There we go. Thank you, Altair. And uh, in the I'm going to zoom in on those with Stellarium so you can see them a little bit better. Here they are. This is the Dedeb. Um, a perfect triangle. It is very easy to see in the night sky. It is very bright stars. Uh, perhaps even um, in the city, if I looked up, I might be able to see those. I'm not sure. But that is your zenith. That is your location that you see overhead right now looking at the sky the evening sky map here are the three constellations and the dotted lines are the asterism the summer triangle and if we were to go back into stellarium so we can look at the constellations here are the cartoons that represent the uh, the swan the harp and the eagle dolphinus or how, however you pronounce that correctly really truly does look like a fish jumping out of the water. It's like a little tiny diamond with a line behind it. That is one of the simplest constellations that you look at it and you, I can see that as a fish, you know, it, it makes sense. Uh, the fox here, not so much, it's two lines, but you know, uh, use your imagination and you can make these things whatever you want them to be too and that could be a part of, uh, uh, an enjoyable part of looking at the night sky and making your own shapes and your own stories sometimes. But uh, let's look at identifying them a little bit easier for ourselves. So we go back to what it would look like normally. 
the summer triangle has its bottom star going right straight through that um, meridian again that, that separates the uh, sky from east to west. And this is a whole sky image looking up at what those constellations might look like. To the left, or to the east, is the constellation Pegasus. Pegasus is a very huge constellation. In a night sky that has dark skies, where you can see a lot of stars, for me, other than the great square, which is here, uh, these other stars kind of blend in with the background a lot. Uh, but finding the great square of Pegasus is an easy thing to do. Uh, we're going to t turn off the cartoons here so you can see them. Here they are. I'm going to keep my mouse going around them in a circle here. Clearly that's a nice big square box. I hope you all can see that pretty easily. Okay. Now, if you can find Pegasus in that square, there are some bright stars trailing off as if they are legs behind the horse. But this is in fact another constellation called Andromeda. Here she is, here. Sometimes there is a second line of stars connected along this path. It depends on the artist that wants to draw them, basically. But if I zoom into Andromeda, we're going to zoom in again here, but there are two dominant stars. Here's our great square of Pegasus. We follow these bright stars down. So one, two, the second star away from the great square, you will see a star. Basically, you know, in this presentation, it, it, it's back into the left. And it's uh, facing kind of north, okay? And then at equal distance between this star and this star will be a very faint, hazy thing. I'm going to zoom in here. With a naked eye, you can see this. With a pair of binoculars, a small telescope, you will clearly see that it is a swirl, uh, a donut maybe, if you will, but that is the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, Musier 31, a uh, French astronomer cataloged uh, back, I think it was the 1500s. Uh, Drew, I think that's right, 1500s yeah. for that. Um, now this is an exact, almost twin to our own galaxy. Sometimes, uh, if you want to be lazy, the textbooks will actually show you a picture of Andromeda Galaxy when they tell you it's our galaxy, because the two are so similar in appearance, and obviously it's very hard for us to take a picture of our own, but this is one of the most distance, distant objects that you can actually still see with your own naked eyes because of its size. But when you see that, you're looking at something that's 2.5 million light years away. Uh, and it is the nearest galaxy, other, you know, outside of our own, closest to us. Uh, and it's kind of a, a school kid knowledge now, too, that this galaxy and our own are more or less on a collision path. We will collide at some point. But when you are talking about things this massive and this size, you know, there are theories that, you know, you may not even know that it's happening as we pass through to each other. It's, there's just so much distance between these objects, you know, individual objects within these two galaxies. But nonetheless, it's, it's a wonderful thing to see with your own naked eye. Um, here's a picture of it from a, a, a standard camera. Again, this is nothing fancy. Uh, this is a camera that's been fixed so that the Earth's rotation itself has been uh, taken out and you can see a little bit clearer. In our uh, observatory here at Copernic, there's a beautiful photo in our 20-inch that was taken with that 20-inch telescope. 
so if you come up and visit us at Copernic when you can, uh, look for that picture inside of the dome of our 20 inch um, telescope. Before, uh, the last thing I'm going to show you in the presentation itself is the a list of the we uh, websites that I used one more time. Uh, the KAS membership area. Uh, NASA has a very simple night sky planner you can go to. Uh, it, again, that's a website, so it picks up your location quite quickly, and you can see what objects um, are visible tonight. And it has a uh, rank system from like beginner to expert, you know, so it's, it is very family friendly. The evening sky map that was in the link in um, our video today is skymaps.com. For tracking satellites, even the planets, anything, anything in space is basically tracked by the, the website Heavens Above, a great and useful website to, uh, to use. The simple star hopping map that I showed as an alternative to um, the sky maps is located at the astroleague.org. Um, sometimes it is not available in the first week of the month. Sometimes you do have to wait until the second week of the month to get that month's map, but uh, it is a very uh, simple to use, very nice, very informative uh, map to have, especially for beginners. Um, the program that we're going to kind of explore a little bit with is Stellarium. That's available for any platform, including phones, at stellarium.org. And another simple website to use to just to figure out what's in that sky tonight. So if, if you do see something and you want to try to identify it, a quick and easy place to go to is inthesky.org. It's a wonderful, simple to use website. Um, but for now, I'd like to jump over to Stellarium just to kind of show people what it is like if, if you have not used it yet. So, um, Drew, is it okay if I bring that over to the screen? Sure, yeah, <clears throat> bring it where you want. Okay. So, Make it large as you can. Yeah. Working. I'm going to turn off a couple of the features here just to, to make it a little bit easier to see. After you've downloaded, um, yeah, it's trying to still track that. So I hit escape and it should let go. No. Mm -hmm. How about if I hit another object? There we go. All right, so Stellarium. Uh, you download Stellarium, you tell it where you are, it picks up your computer's time, usually right away, and if not location, and it's a pretty simple program. Um, we do have it fit on our screen right now where you are missing, I think, a bottom panel. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, Drew's gonna come over and help me with that. Thank you, Drew. When you are using Stellarium, these uh, toolbars are kind of set to automatically disappear. And for me, anyway, it is, uh, it is problematic. So the first um, pro tip, here you go. At the very bottom left-hand corner are two little black triangles that you touch and they turn into little squares and that locks those in for you. So you can always, always see what you have there. Uh, the clock can be fast forward or moved backwards. You could set it for your birthday. You could set it for when the pyramids are, were built. Uh, and then the presentation on your screen does change what the constellations look like, where they are, and all this. Uh, it's a pretty cool tool just for that. Um, we see some fog here in the bottom left hand corner that can be turned off uh, we see um, 
a horizon itself, you can turn the horizon off. But for me, I always like to have that horizon so I can have some type of reference. Because if I'm looking for something that might be near the horizon, I definitely want to know where that uh, demarcation is. Um, oh, they changed the icon on me. When I looked at it last time, it looked different. I'm sorry. Uh, so setting the time, you can either type uh, F5 but, or click the clock, and you can set it to any time. Uh, Drew has a favorite time that we like to talk about, uh, and I always forget, 2017? 2017, August 21st. Well, I went right past that. I can never remember. August 21st. Yep. At 12, make it uh, 12.30. So this, there's another setting. Okay, this is the... Where there you are. go. No? Now it'll zoom in. No. Where is the... Uh, hmm. This is being kind of uh, peculiar. A little it, wonky, yeah. Yeah, normally the... Um, the, the sky would turn normal, but okay. if I were to, well, I need to be on the right page here. If I zoom in on the sun, yeah, right here. there we go. Boy, it takes a village, people. <laughs> <laughs> so if I zoom in on the sun and then push my, my time forward, and we can watch the moon pass in front of the sun as, well, I have to make sure I hit it yeah, though, yeah, so I can track it. Hit the space bar so the camera stays on that. And that is a pretty exact replication of what the 2017 solar eclipse looked like from here at Copernic because that's what it was set as. Um, the versatility of this tool is, uh, is really great because if you want to plan and go to see uh, the next uh, solar eclipse, you can tell this program where you want to go and you can type it in and then you can check out the path of that uh, eclipse. It's really a neat, neat feature. Um, when we turn on the constellations, you can turn on the, the cartoons of what they represent. And, you know, the database is just, you know, full of information. You can uh, it can tell you stories. It can it can give you so much information. Uh, in fact, in some of the computers or some of the um, computerized uh, telescopes can be linked to this, so that you can drive your telescope with Stellarium. But again, I do not know for sure exactly which bits work together. But uh, this is like owning your own planetarium. It is a very useful, fun tool to have. Um, Drew, is there anything that you'd like me to point out uh, specifically about uh, this that we pretty much have run the course of the yeah, presentation? I think, so. I think that's a good, I think we did a good job. All right. I hope everyone has enjoyed uh, the fall skies. I hope everyone will get outside and, and keep looking up, uh, throw back to the stargazer, and uh, enjoy the night skies as much as we do. And when we can get you back to Copernic, I hope we will see you up here. And I'll yeah, so for what it's worth, uh, if you're up for it, uh, tonight at uh, 9.53 will be another pass of the space station. And, uh, but its highest point will be uh, only 15 degrees of elevation. And uh, so it's going to come out of the... Um, it's uh, you're really going to have to have a pretty good low uh, western horizon because it's only going to get maybe about 10 or you know, 15 degrees above the horizon and then it's going to go into earth eclipse and then it basically shuts off but uh, that uh, heavens dash above if you go to that uh, website 
that is actually a pretty outstanding uh, website that we're going to, well, I'm just going to see if I can do one thing here for you. Um, I'm going to bring up Chrome. And uh, Evans dash 11. And doing that, we're going to log in as Copernic. Or actually, See if I can remember my password. It's always a, a good thing. I, you can uh, create yourself a, a password, and uh, so it'll you know once you put your information in, it'll it'll uh, always. My, there we go. So uh, again, so thanks again for joining us. Uh, again, if you're in a position to, uh, to help us out, uh, right down below in the description area, there's a place where you can uh, donate and help, uh, uh, help keep Copernic open and keep, uh, keep these live streams coming. So again, next Friday is the uh, program called uh, Fifth Exposure uh, with uh, a Q&A with the film, uh, filmmakers right afterwards. Uh, International Observe the Moon Night is the next night, next Saturday. And, um, and look to our website and our social media for uh, a future, uh, future program. So uh, have a good evening, stay safe, wear your mask, mm -hmm. and uh, we look forward to having you up here soon. So long. <laughs>